Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hello again. Uh, my name is Tony Allen, and I'm going to be your instructor today as we walk through um, these sessions uh, uh, today and tomorrow on an introduction to uh, high performance computing using a shell and um, how to essentially get on with the with the high performance computing infrastructure that we have here um, at Arch2. A um, little bit of background about me. I am a uh, applications consultant at EPCC, um, which is based at the University of Edinburgh. Um, they administer the Archer 2 National Computing Facility um, and provide this, this training as a, as a form of outreach. Um, I'm going to ask you all uh, a few questions soon just to get a bit of a view of uh, where everyone's at and, and what you're trying to get out of this course today and tomorrow. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I am a geophysicist by training, um, but I've moved sort of into the compute side of things. Um, I'm just completing a PhD at Heriot Watt University um, in uh, seismic history matching, which uh, was a big project that allowed me to use some of the cluster compute facilities that they have um, at that university. Um, so my background is uh, primarily applied physics, but I have uh, quite a big interest in high performance computing. Um, in terms of today's session, I'd really encourage you to ask questions if you're unsure. Um, you can guide this um, instruction, this workshop, uh, to get as much out of it as possible. It's always difficult when you're teaching virtually, you, you don't get a huge amount of feedback from, from the participants. So appreciate any questions. Um, even if you if you want to have a chat during the breaks, that's fine. Uh, overall, uh, I hope that by the end of this uh, two-day workshop, um, you all feel comfortable um, essentially with the tools that you need to access and run code on the clusters or high performance machinery that you will be connecting to in the future, um, that you know how to connect to it, um, and that you understand uh, some of the basic principles around um, how to use that infrastructure uh, efficiently, effectively, and um, to get the most out of it. Okay. Um, if you're not familiar with the Blackboard platform, um, there are uh, there is a toolbar on the right hand side that allows you to um, open a chat where you can either chat to everyone or specific users. Um, I think Holly is helping us this morning. Um, she will be my offsider and providing technical support if you get stuck or lost uh, during the course. Um, otherwise, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on it as I instruct you um, and sort of answering questions as we go. It's always a little bit easier to address things um, at the time. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we move on? Nope. Cool. All right, I'm going to start with a couple of polls here that just to help me gauge um, where everyone is at. Um, the first question I want to ask you is, uh, what is your level of proficiency with PC? So uh, we're just going to go for none, a little, and a piece. You should just see a poll pop up in front of you. Um, if I could get a little bit of feedback here, that would help me a lot. Okay, so everyone's had a little bit of exposure. One person with not a lot, but that's okay. So um, this course essentially covers um, some of the basics of uh, both connecting to the system and how to interact with it. Uh, so if I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know. Um, there is quite a lot of content um, over the next couple of days and uh, we may or may not 
make through, make it through it all. But I would prefer that you understand what we we do um, cover rather than understanding nothing at all. All right, let's uh, let's try another poll here. Uh, so the question is, what platform are you using today? As in what operating system? Okay, decent mix. Um, I'm going to be working from my Windows laptop, but using um, a Linux shell. Um, but if you're on Windows or Mac, hopefully you shouldn't have too much trouble uh, following along. Um, if you do get into trouble, um, again, talk to Holly this morning and then Alexi this afternoon, and they'll be able to help you resolve some of your platform specific issues. Uh, the content um, that supports or the documentation that supports this workshop uh, also has instructions for both um, uh, Linux, Windows and Mac. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. Um, right, hold on, just got a question. I just want to know whether everyone has been able to connect to Archer 2 yet. We've got a question. Uh, hold on. It's a real question. Uh, okay, so everyone's been able to connect to Archer 2. Cool. So, um, we will be moving through that section pretty quickly if everyone has already managed to, to do that. Great. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, oh, and one last question. Um, if you could just uh, stick in the chat um, where you're from and uh, what type of work you want to um, carry out with HPC systems, that would be fantastic. Just give everyone a bit of a view of what, uh, what we're all doing. Thanks, Alex. Uh, bioengineering, I assume that's like uh, biomechanics sort of thing. Cool. All right. Is everyone able to find the chat? Nice. I feel like there's a lot of chat messages that are not appearing in my chat. And oop. computational fluid dynamics, cool. That's a pretty big HPC problem. Fluid dynamics. C 
CFD again. All right, everyone's doing CFD. All right, it should be all pretty switched on then. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to everyone who's uh, posted in the chat. Turbulence. Cool. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, letting us know what you're doing and where you are. We've got quite a few people around the UK and also in the US. So um, welcome, and uh, hopefully uh, this course is uh, just what you need. OK. Um, just going to share a different screen here, and we'll get underway. Um, so in your oh, okay cool uh, in your um joining instructions you should have received links to a couple of websites um that contain the course content um for the next couple of days uh, this is the website for today's content um, with a title here is Introduction to Using the Shell in a High Performance Computing Context. Um, so today we're mainly going to be working through logging on to Archer, which it sounds like everyone has done successfully, which is great. Um, if you haven't, um, just chat quickly to Holly, but we will be covering um, a few of the connection details going forward. Um, if everyone's already connected, I might also show you some configuration options that will make your life a little bit easier going forward. Um, the other things we're going to be talking about today are um, uh, essentially how to use the shell. So some, some key tips and commands that you can use uh, on the command line to perform actions and to essentially achieve your goals on the, the supercomputers. So as you know, um, HPC systems don't provide you with a graphical interface. It's not like the desktop you have at home or in front of you right now where you log on and you can click away to your heart's content with your mouse. Everything pretty much has to be done through the command line with a keyboard. Um, and so this is a dynamic that you know is, can be relatively intimidating and new to a lot of people, but um, once you get the hang of it, it's it's not that bad. In fact, it can become quite liberating um, because it enables you to do many of the things that you need to more efficiently um, and faster than you would be able to do by simply clicking and, and pasting. Um, you'll also find that once you start writing scripts, it becomes a little bit addictive and you can uh, essentially start scripting everything that you need. You no longer have to, to do things manually and, and that can be uh, quite a, a big step change for many people when it comes to their interactions with computers. If you're already doing scripting, um, or if you're familiar with programming, um, some of the things that we covered today uh, might be a little bit basic, but hopefully stick with us. You might pick up a few tips and tricks that uh, you can implement in the things that you're doing already. Um, this website has uh, all the, I call them episodes in the, the carpentries, um, which cover the details that uh, we're going to be going over. Um, I'm going to be basically working from this material, so you can either have this material up or just follow along on screen. Um, we're going to take uh, three breaks today, one sort of halfway through the morning, we'll see how we go, um, a hour or two hour break at lunchtime. Uh, we might cut that a bit shorter if we need to, based on how fast we're getting through the content, and then uh, another break this afternoon. I will try to finish by 4 o'clock. I know everyone's got um, places to be and things to do and other stuff that they're working on, so um, appreciate uh, that uh, your time is valuable. Okay. Um, did I, so I assume everyone sort of worked through the, the, the setup. Um, I might just do a quick poll here. Um, I think this was part of the instructions. This included 
getting connected to Archer 2. Uh, and uh, downloading a few bits of software essentially that, that allowed you to do that um, and were to support the, the teaching today. All right. Just waiting for a couple more. Okay, so right, I'll leave that one up and uh, we'll keep moving. So uh, let's dive into the first episode today, which is more or less about why um, you might want to use HPC. So the main reason HPC exists is that when we perform computations or simulations, uh, those of you doing CFD will be particularly familiar with this, our problems tend to outgrow the capacity of our you know, local machine to compute. Either we don't have enough memory or if we were to run the computation on our machine locally, it would take far longer than we could reasonably be expected to wait for it to complete. You know, in some instances, it might take you know, the length of a PhD to do a simple computation that we could run in a few hours on a, on a large cluster. So these are the primary reasons why you know, high performance facilities exist because we need a pooled resource that we can all share efficiently that allows us to push significant computational workloads through in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and by reasonable, we mean, you know, like hours to days to potentially weeks. So the idea is that um, it is more efficient for us to have these large compute facilities, which are managed by professional staff, which are administered in a way that um, makes it cost effective for individual researchers to use them or, or you know, um, groups of, of individuals to use them. Um, and generally, uh, you know, like everything in life, the economies of scale apply and the same the same is true for HPC systems. You know, no one no one could afford to buy a new compute facility off every grant or or every you know research budget that, that they they get. So so the idea is that we have these these big HPC clusters which help us to um, achieve our research goals, particularly, you know, when they're related to computation. So, you know, a few of those things are covered here. Hopefully this is all pretty self-explanatory, but um, essentially the following advantages apply when you're using HPC. You know, you have greater speed, so more CPU cores, um, often with higher performance specifications than you would have on a typical desktop or laptop. So each core operates more efficiently and faster. Um, a lot of systems have higher volume, both uh, RAM and storage capacity. So if you have large data sets, um, then HPC clusters have the um, you know, capacity to store and then provide or provision that data to the compute side of the of, of the cluster. So very important consideration that, that not many people think about, you know, the input and output process of your algorithms can significantly slow down your computation. So having good communication between your storage space or your, your disk clusters and your compute nodes is uh, particularly important. Um, we talked about efficiency, so HPC systems are almost 
ubiquitously shared between many users and projects. Um, and that makes them um, essentially more cost effective for everyone. So you might have to wait a little bit to get access to um, a facility or, or some, some compute time, but overall your, your, your cost of computation is significantly reduced and the speed of computation is significantly increased by sharing those resources. It's also a better use of you know, research funding and, and government money in the sense that uh, we, we all share um, what is available. Uh, so we sort of touched on cost. Um, and the last one here, I mean, that's kind of, I guess, implicit in what I've just said, but there, there's convenience, right? So um, by pushing the workload off your personal computer, you liberate your personal computer to do other things. I mean, I remember back in the days when you would run something on your laptop or on your desktop computer and your computer would be tied up uh, for many hours, you know, crunching away on things that, that uh, prevented you from doing additional work or being productive um, in that time. So this allows you to uh, essentially use your laptop for the things that it's designed to be used for, you know, email, writing papers, you know, uh, marking, whatever. Okay, are there any kind of questions about that section or things that people want to add? So we kind of mentioned this up front, but um, HP systems more or less always involve interacting um, with the system through a command line interface. So often you'll see this abbreviated to uh, CLI. Um, sometimes it might also be through specialized software or, or, or programming techniques, um, and that will depend upon the system that you're accessing. So a generalized system like Archer 2 is almost entirely through the command line. Um, if you work in a organization or with a company that um, has their own private compute facilities, they might offer um, additional interfaces that allow you to interact with the commute through particular software. Uh, so for example, um, my PhD was about um, essentially optimizing oil and gas reservoir simulations. A lot of companies have like a Windows front end and a cluster that they have somewhere else in the building. Um, and they have specialist software that allows their engineers essentially to dispatch compute jobs to that, that cluster from the software that they use directly. But that's a very specific use case and doesn't often apply in, in, in the research world. Uh, you'll tend to find that most um, public institutions can't um, offer that kind of facility because it's just too difficult to, to organise and maintain. So this sort of defaults then back to interacting with the, with the, the cluster or the, the compute facility through what's called the shell. And uh, it's called the shell essentially because um, it's... Uh, a little like command line program essentially that that allows you to to talk to the computer um, in an interactive way. Now, uh, one of the most popular Unix shells is called Bash, and uh, Bash essentially stands for the Born Again shell, um, <laughs> so called because um, it was written by a guy called Stephen Bourne. You'll find that there's, um, in open source, there's always kind of witty sort of puns like this. Um, and it tends to be uh, one of the most common uh, shells used across uh, Unix systems. Um, HPC systems almost explicitly run, oh sorry, ubiquitously run on um, Unix because it uh, is the easiest to administer and it has the best support for running these large HPC workloads, particularly in sort of shared environments. Uh, 
Now, command line interfaces um, are not a new thing. You know, they've be essentially been around since um, the 1950s and before the 1980s and 90s when um, desktops like uh, Windows 3.1 and that came in. Um, people essentially interacted almost entirely with their computers via a command line interface. Um, there just wasn't the technology or the compute power essentially to support graphical interfaces. Um, and that has somewhat persisted to the current day, particularly um, in the Unix world. So at the heart of the command line interface, you have this concept called read, evaluate, print, and loop, you know, often abbreviated to REPL. And essentially the idea is that um, you will input a command and then the computer will read it, evaluate it, print some kind of response, and then loop back to wait further input. So again, the computer is going to read your command, evaluate it, print some kind of response, and then loop back again to await your next input. And that is simply how command line interfaces work. And the way you tell the computer to do things rather than clicking with your mouse or typing um, things into boxes or clicking buttons um, is essentially to type text commands uh, that the computer interprets or the, the shell interprets um, to go away and do computational work, whether that be moving files, printing the contents of directories, uh, connecting to other computers, um, you name it, you can pretty much do it uh, on the shell. Uh, this last point here is probably worth mentioning. So, so learning to use Bash or any other shell sometimes feels more like programming than using a mouse. Commands are terse, often only a couple of characters long, and their names are frequently cryptic, and their output is lines of text rather than something visual like graph. However, using a command line interface can be extremely powerful, and learning how to use one will allow you to reap the benefits described above as well as many of those benefits that uh, I outlined at the, the beginning of the session. Um, so that more or less sums up this introduction. Uh, in the next section, we're gonna move on to playing around a little bit with the shell. Are there any kind of questions or comments or points that people wanna make before we move on? Again, um, strongly encourage you to uh, interact with the session here. Obviously, these virtual courses are quite difficult for everyone. Um, there's no bad questions. I'm sure if you're, uh, you're thinking it, someone else is. Um, and uh, if they're not, everyone can uh, learn from the, the things that, that people miss. All right, let's, uh, let's skip on to the next section then. All oh, right, right. So the, the next section is uh, all about connecting to a remote system. So in this instance, that is the Archer 2 um, compute facility. Um, and it sounds like most of you have already been able to do this, which is great. So I'm just going to skip essentially down to the point where we talk about creating an SSH key, uh, not because I want you to recreate the one that you've already created, um, but because um, I want to talk about some of the specifics of SSH. So um, in a simple sense, SSH is a protocol that allows you to securely connect to the shell on a remote computer. Um, SSH actually stands for secure shell. And uh, the way that it is done typically uh, is through this exchange of a public and private key pair. So if all of you have been through uh, the process of connecting to Archer 2, 
you would have followed those instructions which sort of explain to you um, how to create the key uh, using SSH keygen, um, the types of parameters that you can pass to that command line argument. So this is a command line program that takes a number of arguments and then how you then use that um, output, which is a, a number of files that are generated for you uh, to connect to the remote system. The private key, the one without the .pub extension, uh, is the one that you should always keep to yourself. That should never be shared with anyone else. And you should also try and have a private key for each computer that you use. So if you are connecting to Arch2 from multiple computers, then you should have a separate one for, for each computer. The other thing that um, you get out of that is the, the public key, the one with the .pub extension. And this is the key that you can give to other systems, essentially, that allows them to verify that it is you who is connecting. A kind of handshake is performed um, as the key allows uh, a, a sort of decryption of information between your computer and the remote system. Now, the way the encryption is done depends on the type of encryption algorithm you choose. Um, SSH supports a few different ones. Um, in these instructions, uh, we talk about RSA, uh, but there's another one also called uh, ED25591 and uh, a few others that I, I can't remember off the top of my head. So this kind of point here just discusses that uh, you need to um, protect your, your private key because if your private key uh, is shared, then it will compromise your credentials essentially. Um, if you do get into a situation where your private key is being shared unknowingly or, or you found out that it's no longer protected, then systems like Archer2 support uh, ways for you to create a new key and a new uh, public key or private key and public key pair and you can upload the the new public key essentially to create a new secure relationship with the with the facility all right um, i'm just going to log in um, essentially to talk about a few things so i'm on uh, windows but using an Ubuntu um, Windows subsystem for Linux installation. Uh, that's another topic of itself, um, but we can talk about that in the breaks if anyone's interested in knowing about that. Um, you can also connect um, these days from Windows 10 to Arch 2 using um, either the uh, command prompt or the PowerShell if you have um, the Windows Open SSH uh, client installed and there are instructions um, on the internet for, for how to do that. Okay, so connecting to uh, Archer 2 is relatively straightforward. Um, remember we're working with this read, evaluate, print loop kind of scenario. Um, the command is just SSH, so this is the secure shell. And then we need to give it um, the identity key uh, that we're going to use to connect to Archer2. Uh, my identity key is stored in this folder called .ssh, and if you follow the instructions, um, it should also be there. This little tilde at the front here just means my, my home directory. So this is like my user directory. And then uh, I called my key Archer2 RSA, but you may have called your key something different. Um, essentially, you need to know what this key is. You then, because uh, my username is a how am I could just type login dot uh, 
but this key, uh, but this relies on the username of my current environment being the same as my username for Arch2. If your username is different, then you can put your username with an at out the front here. So this essentially would be the full sequence to log into Archer 2. Um, the first step is you should have created a password for the SSH keys that um, you created. So the first step is you have to enter the password. Just double check in here. The password the key itself. You'll then see the prompt change because now we've logged into the system, we're actually prompted for the password to connect to Archer2 itself. So at this stage, you need the Archer2 password. And if all goes successfully, you should uh, see the nice big uh, banner here kind of pop up in your shell. Um, you'll see your username and uh, a little prompt here that tells you which landing node you've arrived on. And there are multiple landing nodes on the Arch2 system and we'll sort of cover that um, in the next few sessions. Um, cool. Are there any questions quickly about logging into Archer2 or logging in via SSH generally? Um, We've gone through that pretty quickly. So what I would like to do um, is show you some configuration options that uh, for SSH that might make things a bit easier for you in the future. Let's give some people time if they're typing. No questions. All right, so one of the things that you can do with SSH um, is enter kind of default configurations for what we call hosts. So hosts are more or less domains um, defined by either an IP address um, or, a, or a web address that we can connect to. So. Um, if you want to exit from Archer2, if you've logged in, you just type exit, and this will drop you back to your local session. You can see here that the prompts changed, which kind of indicates the difference between being logged into Archer2 and not. Now, generally, uh, their configuration file for SSH is stored in your SSH configuration folder, which is this dot SSH. Um, and if we have a look at the files in here, you'll see that I've got a file called config. Now, you can edit that file or create it using um, a command line editor like uh, Nano, which we will cover soon. But briefly, you can add configuration um, options to this configuration file for specific hosts. So in this case, I've added a configuration for Archer 2, although my identity file um, is out of date. So it should be this ID Archer 2, this guy here. So if I go back into This should be the identity file that I want to talk to. Um, the contents of this configuration file are listed um, on OpenSSH's website. Um, so we'll sort of talk a little bit about that later. 
uh, but there is a large number of configuration parameters that you can use to help you log into different systems. In essence, you can think of this as like shortcutting a lot of those instructions that we had to put on the command line previously. So now, if I want to SSH to Archer 2, I can simply put in Archer 2 and it will prompt me again. That in wrong. Prompt me again for the password, uh, for the key, and for Archer 2. And I've actually landed on a different landing node this time. It's him on 3 rather than 4. So just quickly again, know that there is a configuration file for SSH that can help you to log into the system more easily. So instead of inputting something long like this and having to remember that every time, you can change the configuration so that you can simply log in via something like this. So that's a quick tip and trick for SSH. Uh, any questions? Because we're going to jump to the next session. I know I'm going um, a little bit quick this morning, um, but it sounded like um, everyone had managed to connect to the system, which is great. That's not always the case. Um, and you all seem to have a little bit of familiarity with um, programming and uh, the shell already, or at least HPC systems. Um, so I think we'll probably get more out of doing some of the exercises this afternoon and tomorrow, um, rather than focusing on um, some of these basic setup and configuration problems. Cool. Um, if that's not the case and I am going too fast, please speak up. Um, because uh, I'd rather not leave you all behind. Cool. Okay. Uh, we do have a scheduled break. We're probably a little bit early. Um, I might move on to the next session, maybe do about 20 minutes, and uh, we'll stop about halfway through or just before any of the exercises, um, give people a bit more time to, to work on those if they want. All right. Um, let me move this over here. So if everyone's able to uh, log back into Archer 2, give you a couple of seconds to do that. So in this session, we're going to be kind of just navigating the system, the Archer 2 system, learning how to work out where we are and what files are available, some basic commands that give us information about um, who we are on the system, what we can do, things like that. Um, this is a pretty uh, sort of introductory level um, introduction to some of the basic commands on the shell um, and hopefully gives you a bit of familiarity about how this 
uh, REPL kind of process works. So right now, um, you should see something in front of you that looks pretty similar to this. You'll see your Archer2 username here um, before the app symbol, and then you'll have um, one of the login nodes after that. So this is LNO3, but I think there's four login nodes, so it could be anything from one, two, three, or four. Um, this whole kind of printout here is generally called the prompt. And you can see this little arrow here and the vertical cursor, which is sort of asking us for something to do. Um, and you can leave this as long as you want. It, it's just going to sit there and wait until you provide it with some sort of command. Um, one of the most basic commands in Unix is who am I? And this command essentially returns your username. So you can see we've input a command. The computer's gone away and evaluated that command. Uh, it printed a response, which in this case is just, hey, how am my username? And it's returned or looped back to asking us for another command uh, line bit of information, basically another command. Um, the way this kind of works, at least within the shell, is that there is uh, a number of places that the shell knows to go and look for programs, programs who have unique names. In this case, the unique name is Who Am I? Um, and when it finds that program, it executes it uh, with or without any of the arguments that we provide to the uh, program itself. If the uh, function can't, or if, if the shell can't find what it's looking for, let's say I mistype the command, it will give you something like command not found. So in this instance, either I've mistyped what I meant to say, or um, the function or program that I'm looking for doesn't cur currently exist on what we call the path or the, the places where programs can be found by this instance of the shell. Um, another common command, another common command is called PWD or parent working directory. And this simply shows you where you currently are navigated to um, on the Unix system. So the full Unix system is essentially managed as a set of folders or directories that contain files. And when you're in the shell, you will always be somewhere within that um, directory structure of your, your system. Um, in this instance, I'm in a folder called, whoops, sorry, I'm in a folder called home, which has a subdirectory called TA076 and another subdirectory called TA076. And finally, my, my username. And you should all, if you haven't moved, be somewhere similar. So you should have this at the front, followed by your username. And this is essentially your home directory. Um, if you type in the tilde, you'll see that that points essentially uh, at this location. So the tilde and this location are all your home directories. Every user has their own unique home directory. Um, and in fact, if you belong to multiple projects on Archer 2, you will have uh, different home directories for each project. Um, and there are sort of data security and other reasons for doing that. Um, another command that you can run is called ls or list. 
this command simply lists all the visible um, documents and directories or files and directories um, in your current folder or in your current um, location. So in this instance, um, I just have a single folder called documents. Um, on other systems or after you've created a number of files, you might see, you know, a larger number of uh, directories and, and files that are, are available. Uh, we can also create directories by using the make dir command. So this is just short for make directory, mkdir. And we can create a folder with any name that we want, as long as it's not the same as the one uh, or any existing folders. So we can't overwrite folders that currently exist within the current location. So in this instance, I could make a directory called test. And if I run the ls command again, we can see that we now have two folders, documents, and test. If I try to rerun that command, you get an error saying that we can't create the directory because it already exists. We can navigate up and down the folder tree or the directory tree using the change directory command, which is abbreviated to CD. So this is CD or change directory. And we simply have to put in the directory name that we want to go into. So in this case, let's go into documents. And now you can see that our prompt changes to tell us that we're in the home slash documents directory. Um, and if we were to test that assertion. Uh, I do not know that question, the answer to that question, Alex. So it might depend on your project, but generally um, on these HPC systems, you'll be set up with a project space and the amount of space allocated to you will depend on your, your um, project funding and, and the allocation that you've agreed with the, the HPC provider. Holly, do you know if there is a limit to home directories and what it might be, at least on Archer 2. Um, just moving on, hopefully we'll get a, yeah, okay, so project specific, right. Um, you can probably find out uh, if you have a separate project other than this training project um, in SAFE, I imagine you can find out in SAFE what your memory or your storage capacity limits are for your project and whereabouts that storage is because it may not necessarily be in your home directory. It might be in a project specific area. Um, generally, you would use your home directory for storing small files or programs that you um, are setting up or using on the system. And we'll get into something a little bit later where we talk about how you um, move uh, data into the project shared storage, uh, which is where you should probably keep most of the things. At least that's the way Archer 2 is structured. It could be different for different HPC systems. Um, and the way that system administrators choose to set it up will depend on the needs of their users and the um, basically the the setup of the of the hardware that they have. So sometimes the um, yeah, so you can check safe. Um, the hardware will determine how the directory structure and space is set up on a particular system. 
you know, unfortunately, I can't really um, be much more specific than that, um, other than to say that on Archer 2, you'll have a limited amount of space in your home directory. Um, and there's another directory on the root called work where most of the project data should be stored. And we'll be using that, um, I think, later today or tomorrow. Uh, getting back to navigating the directory structure, uh, we've changed directory into the, the folder called documents. Um, and remember, we can use this pwd command to find out where we are. And you can see that now this directory path has changed to have the documents folder here on the end. So this is the full path of where we currently are. Now, if we want to go back to our home directory, we can uh, do this in a number of ways. The easiest and fastest way to return to your home directory from anywhere on the system is to use the tilde. So we can go change directory tilde. And if we have a look at where we are, you can see we've returned to that home directory. The other way we can do it is what's called relative navigation. And that uses um, essentially the full stop or period to navigate. So if we want to go up a directory, then we just need to use two consecutive periods or full stops. And this will return us back to the parent directory. Um, a quick note uh, when it comes to Linux, if you see a forward slash at the front of a path, that means that it's an absolute path. So this is a path that references the um, basically the full address of where a folder or a file is stored. Um, and this forward slash right out the front is called the root directory. And you can, you can navigate to that root directory by just changing directory to root. You can see here we've got this forward slash out front now. And if we do ls here, we see a whole heap of different folders. Um, and all of these, almost all of these, are related to managing the operating system. So home is where we, we were. Um, and then there's a whole heap of other ones here which have um, operating system related files in them. Um, and then there's another one we're going to look at later called work, which is where uh, a lot of the project data is stored. From this top level, remember we can either go back to uh, our home directory using tilde, or we could navigate to it directly by going into the home directory slash here. If you hit the tab key a couple of times, it's going to show you possibilities. So it will try and auto complete with the next folder or file. Don't really want to show you 280 possibilities. So we can just put in TAO7, tab auto completes by hitting tab twice. And you can see that there are a number of TAO or TA0 projects we're TA 076, so we can order complete that. And then there was another one of those inside that. And if I just have a look in here, you can see this is all the uh, people who are attending the course at the moment. So these are all your usernames for connecting to the Archer 2 system and, and this project in particular. Um, and I'm just going to go into my own. Here. Okay. Are there any questions about some of those basic commands or just navigating around or the file system in general? Um, we're going to move on to uh, actually, we might, this might be a good point to take a quick break.
uh, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about the different types of HPC file systems um, and how to get help on command line arguments and stuff. Okay, um, let's break for, uh, let's come back at uh, quarter to 11, so in about 10 minutes. Um, if you have any questions during the break, feel free to stick it in the chat. Um, I'll keep a quick look out and uh, I'll see you then. Okay, hopefully uh, everyone's rejoined us. Um, we've had a little bit of feedback on um, the current pace. Most people seem to be pretty happy. Um, when we get to the more complex sections, I will try to slow down a little bit for those that um, might uh, need a bit more time. Uh, again, if you have any questions um, or your uh, struggling a little bit with some of the concepts, um, please just drop a question in the chat um, and uh, I will try to address things a bit more in detail. Uh, so, coming back to the current session. Um, the next section talks a little bit about um, some of the types of file systems that exist within the HPC world and why and when you might want to use them. Um, so similar to your laptop or desktop, um, either at home or at work, there are lots of different file systems that you can use. So maybe working from home, some that you might be familiar with are your local disk storage or an external USB or uh, maybe you have like some cloud storage so you upload things to like Google Drive or OneDrive. Um, you might even have um, some network storage so your university might provide you with some network storage um, that you can access when you're connected to particular networks, for example. Um, there are various pros and cons to using all of these different types of storage um, that you're probably familiar with, uh, but the main things you need to consider when using different types of storage are A, how fast can you access it, so it's latency, so can you load lots of information very quickly or like cloud storage, do you have to wait a while for it to download before you can access it? Um, can you access things that have, you know, a large amount of storage? So your local drive might have two or 300 gigabytes of available storage, whereas a USB disk or a USB pen might only have, you know, 100 gigabytes. So your storage capacity is an issue. Um, another thing people don't often think about is whether or not the storage that you're using is backed up and secure. So um, if something happened to the device which was storing your information, would you be able to get that information back in some way? So a USB pen drive, for example, was a notoriously bad way of backing up uh, any kinds of documents because if you lost the drive or if the drive um, became damaged, then there wasn't really any way of getting the information back off it. You know, sort of why universities now recommend a lot of their students to use things like OneDrive, which is obviously all included in the uh, Office 365 subscriptions that, that lots of businesses have, because that facility is, is backed up to multiple computers. So it's one of the um, 
most uh, or one of the best ways to to have redundancy in your your, your data backup solution. And one of the easiest for many institutions to manage. Um, when it comes to HPC, uh, there's a few different types of file systems. You've got um, essentially network file systems. So your home directory is an example of a network file system. Um, and this is a file system that's available to computers across the cluster. So every computer can see this um, storage. Uh, but that means that it is essentially disconnected from the computer, well, not disconnected, but not a part of the computer that you're actually accessing. The computer that you're on has to send a network request to another computer, which is connected to the hard disk, which then accesses the information and sends it back to you. So this is kind of network attached storage. And because of this connectivity path that it, that, that you have, it's often slower than what we would call local storage. So local storage is storage that is attached um, directly to the, to the machine that uh, you're working on. There is, however, uh, an intermediate step between like network storage and local storage, and that's often termed scratch space. Um, and scratch space um, is typically faster than a network file system, um, but it's not usually backed up. And primarily it's used to support intensive input and output processes where fast disk access is required, but it's an expensive storage medium and therefore HPC clusters can't provide this as the basis for um, all of their storage going forward. Um, there might also be some specific areas um, which uh, have a slightly faster file system access. So in this case, uh, Archer 2 has a folder called work, um, which is faster than the, the network file system, um, but is also uh, backed up. So if you, uh, wait a second. So I think it is backed up on Archer. Holly might be able to confirm that. But um, uh, your home directory, for example, uh, may not be backed up. Uh, the difference between work and scratch in this instance um, on Archer is that uh, files in the workspace or in the work folder directory are not automatically deleted. So um, after a period of time, Scratch, for example, will tend to purge files uh, that have been sitting there for a period of time, typically longer than the, the maximum job length. Um, and the reason for that is um, that that space needs to be liberated for other users on the system to make use of. Um, you then have uh, the next best, which is called Local Scratch. Um, so this is disk space that exists on the compute nodes that you're using. Um, and it is specific to individual compute nodes. So uh, if you are using two different compute nodes, and we'll talk about what that means in a bit, uh, but essentially two different computers, you cannot access the local scratch of one computer uh, from another computer. So often local scratch is used for storing um, information or temporary results that are then reused during the, the current processing job. Um, and they might be at the end of the job um, pushed back to the work file system, for example, um, if the job completes successfully so that you can access and, and use the, the data and results. Um, the last type of storage uh, memory people refer to as memory, um, but it's also called RAM disk. And this is uh, essentially the fastest storage that you have, but because it's so expensive, it's generally quite limited um, in size. So the compute nodes on Archer 2 um, have quite a large amount of memory. I think it's 256 or 512 gigabytes of memory. And there are some special nodes um, that have even more than that. Um, 
So RAM um, is generally where most of your uh, processing um, storage is done, but it's ephemeral, right? It, it exists or, or the information exists in it only as long as, as the program is running. And once the program finishes, you either have to dump your results to some kind of permanent storage, like the work file system or the network file system, um, so that uh, um, you don't lose all of that uh, information you spent uh, lots of time computing. Uh, so on Archer 2, the scratch would be the work file system, essentially. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how to move files around, but our project has its own space um, on that work file scratch. And um, each project will get like its own scratch folder, essentially. Uh, so we talked uh, a little bit about this already, um, but essentially uh, when you're navigating the directory structure in Unix or Linux, um, you have this idea of relative file paths. And relative file paths are represented by these two dot operators or these um, period operators. Your current directory, the place where you currently are, is always represented by a single dot. And the parent directory is represented by the double dot that we use to navigate up from the, the documents directory, if you remember. And then we also mentioned that um, we can use autocomplete and bash by pressing the tab key twice. So if we switch back to, sorry, so if we switch back to our home directory and we use the ls command, you remember we created um, a directory, uh, either documents or test, you can change directory, cd, into one of those folders. See where we are. So this is the absolute path of our current location. We can use a relative directory operator here to access the parent directory. So in this case, we return to our home directory. Now, commands in the bash shell or any Unix shell for that matter often have um, mod modifiers or arguments. Um, and the modifiers are often called flags. Um, and you'll know what a flag is because it, it is preceded by um, a hyphen. Arguments are not preceded by a hyphen and um, we'll sort of get onto those soon. Um, it's difficult uh, to elaborate a lot on how many flags there are for any given command because um, every set of flags is, is usually specific to the command that you're trying to use. Um, as an example, we use the list command. Remember this uh, shows us um, all the files and directories in a folder. We can add a dash a flag. Um, and this shows us a little bit more than we had before. Remember when we just did ls, we only got documents and tests, but when we add the dash a, it shows us a bit more. And these are all the hidden files. And we know it's a hidden file because it starts with a dot. Um, in Linux, by convention, hidden files and folders all start with dots. Um, and it will show us these files and directories um, that were previously not shown by just the ls command. So this is an example 
of a simple flag. Another nice flag that you can give to the ls command is the dash l flag, and this just stands for uh, as a list essentially. And this modifies the print output of ls to give us a little bit more information um, about each file or folder on a row by row basis. We'll talk a little bit later about what these letters mean over here on the left. Um, but essentially, if you have a D as the first here, this is directory. It also tells us um, who the owner is. So you'll see a different username here, your username. So I'm the owner of these files. And it also shows which group these folders belong to. And, and that determines basically the permissions of these files. So who can read, edit, and run them. There's some other information, um, including the bit size or, or the number of bytes that this object takes up. Uh, folders are just symbolic links, essentially. So they're always represented by um, the minimum uh, chunk size on the disk that the object is being stored on, in this case, uh, four kilobytes. Um, and this isn't representative of the actual size of the folder's contents, right? So you need different commands to kind of find out that information. Um, it then also shows you the date and time at which the folder was modified. So you can see I created this test folder this morning at, at 10.24. Cool. Uh, what else are we going to look at? Um, you can also chain flags together, right? So let's say that we wanted to use this uh, list operator as well as the hidden file operator. So we can pass both of these to the command that we're, we're trying to execute. And in that instance, we'll get a slightly longer uh, printout that contains all of the hidden files and folders. So you can see, for example, uh, this .vs code server is a directory, uh, whereas this wget hsts is a file. Um, and this will show us everything, including um, the parent directory and the current directory. Right? Uh, you can also see that the permissions are slightly different for um, the parent directory, which is the, the project directory within home. Um, and if I go up that, so now I'm in this directory TA0076 or 076, and we do an ls-l, you can see that each of you is the owner of your particular home directory here. Cool. I'm going to return to my home directory, just clear this. Um, so it can be a little bit tedious uh, when you're doing this list command, essentially to type out the hyphen uh, every time you want to pass a new flag to uh, the command. Um, so to avoid doing that, the command line also understands the situation where you concatenate the flags together. So in this case, I'm going to pass the command ls-la, and this isn't a separate command is actually just um, the same as ls minus l minus a, uh, but with the two together. So it understands that it will separate these two little flags um, to create the chained response. Are there any questions about um, flags at all? Cool. All right. So in General, 
if we were to think about commands on the bash command line or any command line for that example, they almost always have the following form. There will be a command. So in this instance, it was ls um, or we saw another one which was make dir earlier. Uh, and then there will be a number of options or flags that we can pass to that command and those flags will be dependent on the command that we're using. Uh, and then there will be um, a set of arguments. Um, and it can be just one or it can be many and the type of argument that is expected will be determined again by the command that you're trying to run. And that can be a little bit confusing to begin with, but as you begin to use different programs or commands on the command line, you will become more familiar with how they work and the different flags and options that you can use. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit after this quick demonstration about how you get help for these commands. But before I do that, let's just see a, a quick example of this uh, command, flag options, and then arguments type layer or syntax. So we're going to use ls as an example. Um, we're going to pass it the dash l and the dash a options. Um, and then uh, what we can do is we can pass it an argument, which is a folder or a path at which we want it to list files. So, for example, let's tell it to list us everything within the documents directory of my, my home folder. In this instance, there is no contents to that folder. So all we see is the uh, current directory or the, the documents directory and the parent path. If I was to change this to the root directory, which is just a forward slash, then we would see all of those folders that we saw previously when we navigated to the root directory. And actually, you see some more interesting information here telling us about where some of these folders are pointing at, right? So anything with uh, these, this arrow is telling us that this is a link to a mounted file storage system. So this is a file storage system that um, is not local to the node that we're working on, which includes home and work where we're going to go and have a look at later. So this is one of those scratch areas uh, that we were talking about. So how do you find help about commands? How do you know what flags you can pass? How do you understand what arguments different commands accept? How do you even know what commands are available, right? I mean, that's a pretty good question because there's no help menu specifically um, when you look at the, the shell like this. Um, there are, however, built-in commands to help you get help, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, the most common one people use is a command called man, which uh, is short for manual. Um, so if we look at the, the manual for ls, doesn't have it. Uh, oh, there we go, they're loaded. Um, you will be presented with um, a page that kind of looks like this. They all have a similar layout that you'll become familiar with the more you look at them. But in general, there'll be um, the name of the command and a brief description of what it does. So this one just lists directory contents. Um, the synopsis here describes the uh, basically the, the syntax that the command understands. So at the beginning here, you pass the command itself. And then in square brackets, we have options. And 
there's a whole heap of options sort of listed below here for us to look at and read about. And this ellipsis here basically means that it takes multiple options. So we can provide multiple options to LS. If there was no ellipsis, then it would only ever take one option. And then it takes a file or uh, a path, essentially. And um, it actually accepts multiple paths. So we could list the contents of multiple directories if we wanted to with a single, a single command. Um, if we scroll down using the arrow keys, we also get um, a list of the options that are available for LS. So we already saw the dash A one. So this is do not ignore entry starting with dots. So these are the by convention hidden hidden files. Um, uh, but there's also a lot here that we haven't um, seen. Uh, for example, if we wanted to do dash A, but not to show the relative paths, then we could just change the little a to a capital A. Or uh, if we wanted to see directories, then we could just use the dash D. Or another one I like to use is dash H. So sometimes, sometimes if you um, have files with really large file sizes, uh, the sizes of the files can be difficult to interpret when they're printed in bytes. So dash H will convert those to readable file sizes like megabytes, gigabytes, and so on. Um, and another common one is uh, I mean, a lot of these I don't use regularly, um, but you'll find the ones that are important to you. But another one I like is the uh, dash T here. Um, and this one will sort the files based on the modification time. So let's sort of have a look at how those work. Oh, um, to exit out of the manual, um, you just hit Q and it will return you to the prompt you were in before. So, NLS to get into it, uh, just going to go in and then Q to quit. And you'll see that it tells you that down the bottom. Uh, you can also press H to help in this section and it will give you a number of commands here to try and find things if you're looking for stuff quickly. Uh, so you can navigate up and down. Um, this little hat before a letter means control. So to get this command would be control shift B because it's a, it's a big B um, and, and so on. So there are useful bits of information here that, that can help you um, kind of navigate the manual and find things. So Q in this instance returns us back to the manual and then Q to exit. Um, so going back to those new commands we found, or those new arguments I should say, we want let's say the big A um, and then sometimes I like to use the T here together with the L to give me a list it doesn't contain the relative paths, but also sorts the files by the date they were modified with the most recent at the top. You can also put the most recent at the bottom by adding an R, which means reverse. So in this instance, we reverse the list or the order of the list. Um, an alternative to accessing the manual page of LS is many commands include a quick help which will print directly to the window you're working in. So whereas previously man showed us like a new window essentially within the, the shell that then disappeared when we quit, we can show the full help within the current shell just by passing the dash dash help flag. And this is the same contents that was in the manual, but 
instead it's printed into the shell and you can sort of scroll up and down through that before entering your command down the bottom. Note that um, maybe this wasn't um, or explicitly understood, but so uh, you can also connect to Archer multiple times via SSH. So you're not limited to having a single shell uh, open on the Archer uh, machine. If you want to um, have both a manual page and a command line that you can work on uh, open on the same screen or, or on different monitors. So the number of SSH sessions you have might be limited um, for network reasons, but two, three or four sessions should be perfectly fine. Uh, you will unfortunately have to log in <laughs> for each shell that you open. Uh, cool. All right, um, so there's a few other um, things in this episode that we should talk about. First is what happens if you enter a flag that isn't understood. Uh, so in this instance, I'm going to try and pass the uh, dash J flag down here to LS. And when you do that, um, it just tells you that you've passed an invalid option. So in this instance, LS doesn't understand what you want from the command line J or from the from the flag J. So uh, to um, respond to that, you can either type the correct letter that you meant to type, or again, it gives you the prompt to enter the, the help and try and find uh, a command that matches what you're looking for. Uh, cool. So, um, there, if everyone is able to navigate, we'll stick this in the chat to the current episode that we're working on. Um, there's a few exercises at the bottom of this documentation, uh, at the bottom of this documentation. Um, if you want to work quickly through that or ask any questions in the chat, um, we'll take a quick breather here for 10 minutes um, while you work through this. It shouldn't take you too long. They're quite, quite basic exercises. How is everyone doing? Um, I haven't seen any questions yet, which means I'm either a really good instructor or a really bad one, depending on how you look at it. I've got a quick poll up at the moment, just uh, try and encourage people to indicate when they're ready to move on. Looks like uh, most people have finished. So I'm going to just quickly address these exercises. Again, um, if you have any questions, let me know and uh, I'll, I'll stop to try and explain things. Um, so the first exercise here is asking us to work out what the dash H flag does, or it has a, it has a longer um, flag name called dash dash human dash rootable. I kind of already uh, gave this one away in the, the previous section, but um, we can remember we can find out uh, some context, some content for the help, especially for LS, by just going dash dash help. We scroll back up, these are all in alphabetical order, to the dash H flag. We find out that um, it print sizes um, in human reasonable form. Right. So that one's pretty straightforward too. We also talked uh, a little bit about relative paths. So 
let's imagine that we're in this absolute path here, users Amanda data, uh, which is a directory, it's got this slash on the end. And uh, we want to navigate to the parent directory of data, which is users slash Amanda. Um, so the command that we're going to use here is we want to change directory, so they're all CD, and we want to go to the parent directory, which is represented by the dot dot. So nine would be the shortest way, but actually there are other ways of returning to our own directory. Um, eight apparently without even the tilde is a quick way of returning to the home directory. We talked a little bit about the tilde um, and what it represents. So this is also a valid way of returning to the directory. Um, this chained operator dot dot slash dot dot will take us up two parent directories. So in that instance, we'd end up in users um, we could cd into slash home, or we couldn't, or we could try to cd into slash home slash Amanda. But home uh, isn't the path or the absolute path that we want to go to. So this will take us to the wrong place. Uh, just putting a slash at the front here, this will take us to the root. So that's not the right way to go either. And the dot will just take us to the to the current directory, so none of those will work. Um, home is an understood variable, so that won't work. And although it's a bit counterintuitive, seven will actually work as well, because this will take us to the users directory, then into data, and then back up again. So this is sort of navigating down the path and back up. So this is sort of a valid navigation route as well. Um, an interesting scenario of where you might want to use this kind of paradigm is let's say you're in uh, folder A and it has an adjacent folder, folder B, and you want to move some files from A to B. You could navigate into A, use the move command, which we'll get to shortly to move those files up and then back down the directory tree. So you can sort of chain these operations together to get to the relative location that you want to. All right. Uh, using the file system diagram below, if PWD displays or, or the parent working directory displays user slash thing, what will ls dash f dot dot slash backup display? So PWD means we're in the current working directory is here. So we're in thing. And we want to know what dot dot backup will display. So dot dot will navigate us back up the tree. And then backup will navigate us to the folder within our parent directory that is called backup. And then dash F will just display the folders in that location. So in this instance, we're going up with the dot dot, back down with backup. So we would expect it to show us four. And that's correct. Um, we wouldn't display the contents of backup in our current directory because the dot dot here forces us to leave to the parent directory. If we remove the dot dot slash backup and we just had backup, then we would see the contents of that directory. Reading comprehension. Assuming a directory structure as in the above figure, file system for challenge questions, if PWD displays forward slash users backup, so we're in this folder, and dash r tells ls to display things in reverse order. What command will display pnas, pnas final, and original? 
So I think this assumes that uh, original is created first. Uh, sub might have been created second and then final was created third as the last modified directory. That would be my guess. So this would display them in reverse order. Um, oh wait, sorry. So the R here refers to the alphabetical nature of the folders. Um, because we're not using the dash T operator. So this will just change the order of the list. Otherwise it displays them alphabetically. So alphabetically would be uh, the current original PNAS final and PNAS sub. So it would just be dash R dash F. Yes, but also three because we're pointing at the absolute path. Um, if I'm not explaining these well, please ask questions. All right, I think that one was pretty self-explanatory. We saw earlier that dash H is just going to make um, the file sizes more human readable. And we know that dash L from earlier generates the sort of table list display. So um, it's going to create the what they call the long listing format, uh, which is that table display, and the H will make things human readable. So it turns byte sizes into sort of kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and so on. Um, and we also saw earlier what we do. What sorry, what happens when we combine the um, reverse and time displays, and even if we display them with dash L. So this is how we see um, our folder contents um, ordered by time. All right, uh, before we move on, there's a couple of things that I'm going to um, share with you. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to work on the uh, manual pages. Sorry, where are we? Um, so there are a couple of websites out there which can help you understand some of the more common command line arguments. Um, and as you start Googling things on the web or trying to learn how to do things, sometimes you'll see commands um, which you don't understand or which have like a complex syntax that doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Um, well, a basic sense, there is um, a page that the software carpentry provides, which I'm going to paste in the chat here, that contains a long list of commands that you can use, sort of like a bit of a cheat sheet, and it sort of demonstrates some of the um, most useful information related to using the shell. Um, but there's also this website called um, explainshell.com. In here you can punch in commands. So, for example, let's put in the ls-art command that I put in earlier. Oh, sorry, missed height here. There was an L on there too. So in this instance, I'm just putting in the command that I want to run. Um, it complained when I didn't get the command right, but it has a nice kind of way of explaining things. So here you can see the name of the command. In this case, it's just ls. And then you can see a breakdown of what each of the flags does. And it will tell you how these are all working together. And in fact, I think we could for example, add an argument here like documents. And you can see here that it tells you that this is the uh, folder or the target that it's, it's going to list the files for. So this is kind of like a neat way of 
uh, understanding commands or building them up if you if you need to to work on things. You can also click uh, on the command itself. And it will show you essentially the man page, but rendered nicely in HTML. Um, so this is a nice resource if you guys uh, feel you need a little bit more help around some of these, these basic commands at the beginning. Okay, let's go back. All right, one more session before lunch. Um, try to uh, get through this, probably finishing um, about 12.30, I think, if that's okay. Uh, and then we'll have um, an hour or an hour and a half for lunch, depending on how we go. Um, so the next section, oh, sorry, uh, one last thing. If there's any questions on the last session before I, I move on. So the, the next uh, section is going to be entirely about uh, writing and reading files um, within the command line. So we're not going to use any kind of desktop based editing software to edit text files. Um, and we're talking entirely here about like simple text files. Um, we're going to use uh, a text editor called Nano which is a little program that runs uh, inside the shell um, and basically visualizes the contents of the text file in a way that you can uh, interact with it and edit it. Um, if you're familiar with other text editors, um, common ones are like VI or Vim um, or Emacs. Um, free field to work with those, but um, if you're just beginning, I strongly recommend Nano. In fact, I use it almost exclusively if I'm working in this kind of environment. Um, and I use other tools um, when I'm doing uh, slightly more complex things. But we can talk about that in a break. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to return to our home directory, so cd tilde, or indeed just cd. And we're going to make a directory using the make the command called hpc test. And we want to enter that directory. And remember, you can type the first couple of letters and hit tab, and that will auto complete for you. So you're typing it out. Um, there's a few ways to create a file. Uh, you could either call Nano directly with a new file name. So just the example here, we have a file name called draft.txt. Or there's actually another command which sometimes people use called touch. This really just creates like a placeholder for a text file. So it just creates like a new little text file that has nothing in it. So that's one option. Um, either or is fine, just depending on what you're doing. Um, but if you run nano draft.txe, for example, you will have your view change to something like this. At the top, there is the name of the file that you are working on. So this is the file that's currently open. Uh, there's a version number here for nano. So this is nano 2.9.6. Uh, the GNU here at the front just refers to the source of the editor. So this is the organization that creates the software. Um, and then down the bottom, you have uh, basically a legend with a number of commands in it, which we'll sort of come to in a second. And you see nothing else because there's actually no contents to this file. We just created it. Um, but the cursor is up here on the left-hand side. And 
straight away we can just start to edit this file by typing away. So in the example, they have this text. And it's sort of just like a normal text editor. You can type away as you want. You can backspace. You can capitalize with the shift key or with the caps lock. So things are kind of straightforward. And you just navigate around, edit things with the arrow keys. And you end up, oh, sorry, I missed blur here. Let's put that in. You end up with essentially some text in a file, but this text only exists in memory, right? So we've just got the, the editor open and we haven't actually saved the file yet. To save the file, um, we're going to use this control O. So remember this little hat here at the beginning means control. So control O is write out. So we can write out this file to disk by pressing control and O, and it will give us a little prompt that says, where do we want to write this to? And this is actually editable. So you can see here if I press the backspace, I remove the extension from that file. Um, so if we wanted to, we can control O to another file name, and that would be equivalent to like a, a save as. In this instance, we just want to write back to that draft.txt. Um, and if we hit enter, it tells us that it wrote two lines, and that file is now saved. Um, assuming that we didn't want to make any more changes, uh, we can exit the editor now by pressing Control X. So put a little exit down here, which is a hat Control X. Uh, anyone who's using Mac, I remember last time there was some issues in the way the keyboard translated uh, for nano um, when you're sending commands uh, to edit or save or, or exit. And if I remember right, you had to use the command key instead of control, maybe, I forget. Do you, do you know, Holly, I think you use a Mac, don't you? Okay, you can use control, cool. Um, if anyone's having trouble, um, let me know. Uh, there was a fix to that, but I can't, I can't recall off the top of my head. It's a few months ago that we did this. Um, anyway, I'm just gonna quickly exit back out here again. So we have a saved and um, editable text file now. If we do an LS here, we can see that we've got a draft.txt in this current directory. If we run nano on that file again, it doesn't overwrite the file with a new file. It just opens the file for editing. So now we can come back in and make changes to the file if we need to. Uh, there's another couple of uh, commands in here that are useful to know. Um, you can cut a line or kill a line essentially by pressing Control K. So this will basically move a line and then you can navigate to another spot and hit Control U and it will insert it. Uh, you can also um, press Control W to find something. So if you've got a particularly large text file uh, maybe you're searching for a particular word or string. So in this case, we might try and find the parish. And it will basically, like your Word document, take you to each occurrence of that. Uh, let's see if we can do that for some. Yes. It's they put in few reoccurrences here. It seems like it's case sensitive. Uh, 
But yeah, so if you just keep hitting Control W, it will take you to the next occurrence, essentially. Uh, the uh, M here means shift. So shift U would be it's alt U. Yeah, I have misunderstood that. I thought this M was shift. Um, either way, I will check that up in the break and get back to you. Um, so let's uh, up, that out, put it back below, write it out with Control O, and hit Enter. It's now five lines because there's uh, space below. Um, there's also some other ways to uh, look at the contents um, of a file without actually going into it. So um, Linux provides us some additional commands to see the contents of the file without going into uh, like a text editor like Nano. A um, common command that people use is called cat, which um, is short for concatenate. So we can pass it draft.txt. It will just print the contents of that file uh, back to the um, uh, shell. Um, cat also works with uh, multiple files. So for example, we can pass cat multiple arguments. Uh, we only have one file, so let's pass it uh, the same file twice. In, in this instance, it will just iterate over each argument, printing the contents uh, to the shell. Oh, escape M, cool, good to know. Right, alt M. Let's just uh, check that. Thanks for looking that up. I hit Alt M. Oh, alt, sorry, Alt U. Oh yeah. So undo and Alt E. Redo. Cool. Sorry about that. Thanks for helping me out. Uh, Interestingly here, right, I haven't saved anything, so it prompts me whether I want to save the, the modified buffer. So this is the file in memory, essentially. Um, and you can hit Y or N to um, do one or the other, or Control C to go back to the editor. I'm just going to hit N here, and the file should be ended. Uh, so um, we're going to move on to kind of moving and renaming and copying things. Um, it was a very brief introduction to Nano, but uh, it's quite a powerful and useful editor that's relatively simple to use. Uh, did anyone have any issues or questions about the editor itself? All right, so uh, the next section begins by essentially creating a directory called uh, files. So we're just going to use the ekdir command. Oops, sorry, misnamed that. So let's make a directory called files with an S. Uh, and um, this just creates a new directory in our current location called files. 
and we can see that directory and the one that I misspelled here called file. Um, if you misspell something, you can either move it to the name that you want it to be, so rename it essentially, or remove it, and we'll sort of see how that works down the line. Uh, So actually the, the next command is going to be uh, move. So move is uh, abbreviated to MV. This essentially allows you to move um, a file or folder uh, from one location in the directory tree to another location. Um, and the way it works is you have, so if we have a look at the help here, you have some options, um, like most Linux commands, which are sort of all listed below. And then you have a source or a number of sources in this case. And then the final argument must be a directory where we are going to move things. So this is like the target destination. The way we can do this is, for example, let's have a look at our location here. We have a draft.txe and a couple of directories, file and files. So we might, for example, move draft.txt into files. So in this instance, this is the, the sources or the, the files that we want to move, and we could have multiples of those and files because it's the last argument is the destination. And if we now look at contents of our current directory, you'll see that draft.dxd no longer exists here. If we look at the contents of files, remember we can pass a argument to ls that will show us the contents of that location then we see that it contains draft txt now. So we've essentially moved the draft.txt text file that we wrote from HPC test into files. All right, let's uh, let's go into into the files directory, and we'll just do an ls. See what we've got here again. So we've got our draft.txt. Uh, let's say that we're not really happy with the name of our file and we want to call it something else. Um, there isn't a rename command specifically um, in uh, Linux, but what you do is you move a file essentially to a new file name. So if we have a single file that we've specified to move, such as draft.txt, we can specify a new name for that file. So in this instance, let's call it like new name.test file or some other wacky name. And when you execute that move operation, it essentially reassigns that file to a new file name descriptor. And this operation is quite fast. So even if you have large files, as long as you're not moving them um, to other file systems, this notion of moving files um, but for renaming um, is actually really just like changing the, the link that, that Linux looks for to identify where the file is on disk. So the renaming operation is actually very quick, even for, for very large files. Um, we can also create copies of files. Um, and the way we do that is using the CP, file, CP command, which is of course short for copy. Um, so let's copy the new name.test file 
to another file called copy.test file or something equivalent. In this instance, if we run ls again, you can see that we now have two versions of the file, one called copy.test and one called new name.test file. And we can look at the contents of the copied file using cat. See that it does indeed contain the same contents that we had in the new name.test file originally draft.txt. This might be uh, an interesting point, for example, to go into our copy.test file with nano. And we're going to add some additional text here that says from the copy. Put that out. And remember that we can pass multiple files to cat. The first one should be unmodified, so that should still contain the original text that we put in the file. Whereas the second copy.test file we've changed to contain the additional words from the copy. And here we can see that we've printed those two files and indeed they are different now. All right, any questions quickly about um, make the uh, move or copy um, before I go on to removing files. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, let's say that you've created a number of files and you need to delete them for whatever reason. They were temporary or they're confidential or um, they're just no longer needed um, and you want to clear up some space for your project. Um, the, this, the remove command or RM as it's shortened to is essentially how you remove individual files. So we can, for example, remove the file copy.test file um, by passing it to the remove command. And in this instance, we're now back to our original file um, because the copy has been removed. Uh, if we want to remove a directory and we pass the directory to RM, we'll get a complaint. That's because Linux tries to protect us from deleting directories unnecessarily. Um, to do what we want to do, we actually need to pass the uh, dash r, which means recursive. So this means that we're going to um, go into each child directory of the directory that we pass, delete all the files that exist in that child directory, and then return up a level and remove the files from that directory, and then return up a level until we reach the parent directory that we were trying to delete. So in this instance, file was obviously empty, but it deletes it. And if we use dash r on the files directory, which is the one that contained our new name.test file, it will remove the entire contents of that folder and the folder itself. So we now have no folders anymore in this area. Often, um, 
on the internet, you might see tips for removing directories that look uh, something like this, rm-rf. And the F here stands for forced. And um, this is a way of basically overriding many of the um, protections that Linux has in place to prevent you from um, deleting things unnecessarily. When you use F, it also um, makes the, the directory essentially unavailable. Or when, sorry, when you use RM, the directory after it's deleted is more or less unavailable. You can't recover it like you can say on Windows or Mac. There's no waste bin uh, for your deleted data. So you need to be quite careful about how you use uh, RM or remove, and specifically if you ever use this dash F operator. There's quite a specific um, example in the uh, documentation um, that talks about using RF um, accidentally with wildcards. So for example, please do not run this, um, but if you ran rm-rf on the root directory um, with the wildcard star, so star here basically means everything, you would start deleting all of your operating system files if you had appropriate permissions. Um, and that just would completely destroy the system. So be mindful about where you use RM and particularly mindful about where you use the, the F flag with it. Uh, okay. Um, let's go back up to our home directory. And what I want to do now is essentially download um, some data for us to have a quick look at. So I'm going to post a command here in the chat, which is also in the documentation if you're following along. But if you copy and paste that command into your session, it will go to the website, the current website that the documentation has, and download a file called bash lesson uh, bash lessons.tar.gz. And if you execute that, you should get something like this. So it's not a huge file, just 12 meg, and it should download pretty quickly. Um, wget uh, is a you need a neat little command that stands for like uh, webget, I think. Do something here in the help. Um, but it's a neat way to download files uh, from the internet using the shell. Yeah. Oh, so not interactive network retriever. So any kind of network um, which includes the internet, it can. Uh, go and fetch data for you, as long as it's uh, accessible. Cool. So tar files um, and uh, the GZ on the end here basically indicates um, a zipping. So it's kind of like a zip with some sort of compression. And the, the GZ uh, is gun zip compression, but you might see other types of compression uh, like BZIP2, which is often abbreviated to BZ2 on the end of files, or um, uh, what's another popular one? X, XZ, I think, is another popular one. So there are a few available. Um, GZ is pretty commonly used within the Linux environment for compressing data. And the TAR here is um, an old term that refers back to when computers were too small to store large amounts of information 
um, on a single either hard disk or magnetic tape. Uh, and TAR actually stands for Tape Archive. And so what uh, they used to do in the old days is when files were too big for external tape storage is they would use the tape archive program to bundle lots of files into a single file um, and then be able to cut it up so that it would fit onto uh, individual uh, tapes. Some of you might be old enough to remember when you would essentially have to zip up Word documents um, and cut the zip up so that it could fit on a on a floppy disk, for example, or maybe even um, the smaller USB drives when they when they first came out. Generally, this isn't an issue these days. Um, where it can still be helpful, though, is if you're transferring large amounts of data to and from the cluster, you can use tar archives to both compress the data so that the amount of information you have to transfer is not as large. Uh, and you can also use it to cut it up so you can transfer in, in um, chunks uh, that preserve your progress. So if the, the transfer fails halfway through, you don't have to restart from the beginning. Uh, to extract the tar archive that we just downloaded, we're going to use the tar command, pass it the flags dash xvf stands for um, extract uh, verbose and two folder, I think. Remember we can, uh, what we can do, we can go to our any shell oh, was to oh, explain shell. Uh, and we can look at tar-xdf. So we're going to extract files from the archive. We're going to do it in a verbose way. So this means the shell is going to give us lots of information about what it's doing. And we're going to extract um, a file archive, essentially. So um, this tells us that we've got a, a tar archive. So tar in, uh, in this instance, we're going to extract that archive uh, and rest file that we downloaded. And you can see that um, it gives us a bit of printout here. And this is essentially information telling us about the files that it's extracting. And if we run an LS now, we can see that all those files have basically been extracted to the, the current directory. Um, remember, we also downloaded uh, about 11 megabytes of data. So if we do an ls-lh to get human readable, uh, you can see that we've got um, lots of files here, these fast files that are 1.6 megabytes in size. We've also got a GTF file here, which is 74 megabytes in size, and a gene association file that's 24 megabytes in size. So that GZ compression saved us transferring maybe 100 megabytes worth of, of data. So that was a, a useful exercise to, to do. Um, if you have zip files that you're using to transfer data, um, there's the command unzip, which does the same thing. Um, and uh, as I said, you can also encounter other types of um, compression extensions, such as .bz2, and those will also work with tar. If you, if you get into trouble, um, just use Google, Google's your friend, and it will tell you how to extract the information that, that you're trying to get to. All right, I'm going to keep going. We just got another five, 10 minutes to go. Um, are there any questions about uh, 
the things that I've just talked about with file compression or extraction um, or other things you might want to know related to that because um, we're going to start introducing a couple of other commands here that help you to look at large sets of data. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so we saw that uh, this DML file here was quite large, 74 megabytes, right? So uh, if we were to try and run CAT, I don't, I don't recommend you try and print out the contents of this file to the shelf, but uh, try to show you. Essentially, it's going to print out an excessively large amount of information and it will keep going until it gets all the way through the file. Now, this is not useful to anyone, right? Um, so if you do this by mistake, you can cancel a command at any time by pressing C. See here that uh, I've returned back to the prompt. The control C sends a kill signal um, to the currently running command and forces an interrupt essentially on the execution phase of that REPL loop, right? Instead, um, there are some handy commands that we can use to have a quick look at the contents of the file. Uh, the first one that we're going to learn about is called head. Head just looks at, by default, the top 10 lines of a, of a file. So let's say a DML file. In this instance, it executes very quickly. It doesn't overload us with content. And we can see that we've got uh, 10 lines. Uh, the lines here are wrapping in some instances. So um, everywhere you see an X is the start of a line. And then the lines are too long for the number of characters that I can fit onto this um, shell session. So the, the letters here are wrapping around. If I was to shrink my shell session, uh, you can see that you get additional wrapping. So in this case, I get three lines of wrapping, which isn't helpful. Oh. Let's go back to where we were. Um, these are lines that contain information about um, a particular type of fly's genome. Um, it's not particularly uh, um, meaningful to me, uh, but uh, we can use this file to demonstrate, I guess, uh, a few of the things that we, we want to do when we look at large text files like this um, remotely using the shell. Um, so that was head, which allows us to look at the top 10 lines. Um, we can actually tell head that we want to look at uh, a specific number of lines. So let's say we only want to look at one line. We can use the dash n flag. And the dash n flag actually takes an argument of its own. In this case, uh, an integer telling us how many lines we want to show. Let's uh, do that. So in this instance, we just get one line. If you play around with that, you see that you can change this to five lines or 50 lines, or indeed as many lines as you want. So that's the dash n argument. Ed has a um, relation or a sibling command called tail. And guess what this one does? But it shows us the last 10 lines of a file. So this basically takes lines from the end of the file and, and prints them. And it's much faster than uh, trying to look through the whole file because we can, sometimes there might be like a, an end file operation or something. And we want to know whether the file changes. Uh, let, uh, tail also takes um, the same Q 
keyword arguments uh, or the same flags as uh, as um, head does. So that can be useful. Another useful command is uh, less. So this command is uh, an interactive command. And what it does is it fills the current view with as many lines as it can, can from the file that um, you asked it to look at. And then it gives you some information down here in the bottom corner. This is the current file open. Uh, this is the lines that it's displaying, 1 to 17 inclusive. Uh, and then the second number here is the number of total lines in the file. So you can see there's uh, 542,000 odd lines. And then the percent here is basically how far through the file you've navigated. And the reason I say this command is interactive is because if you hit the space bar, it will take you to the next view of lines. And this is kind of like paging through a table or some articles on a website. So you're just sort of paging and looking at each page in turn. Um, and the zero percent here isn't going to change much because uh, we'll have to go a long way. You can hold space and it will scroll until you get to an appropriate location. So now we're 1% of the way through the file. Uh, I think with head, we have a look at the, no, maybe it's with less. I uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but there is also some commands that allow you to look at uh, specific lines within the file, uh, but we might get to that on the next session. Okay, so just to summarize this session before lunch, uh, we had a look at Nano, uh, how to edit files whilst you're in the shell. We had a look at the cat command, short for concatenate, which allows us to print the contents of one or more files to the shell. We looked at the move command um, for moving files around and for renaming files. We had a look at the copy command so that we could create a copy of a file or um, copy a uh, so just copy of a file. Um, and we also looked at the remove command um, for how to delete files and folders and talked a little bit about uh, some of the things you need to be cautious about when using that. Um, there's a final point here that I want to make, and that is that file names and file extensions in Unix are completely arbitrary. So there are conventions about the ways that you should name files so people know what the file is, like a, a tar file or a zip file or a text file. But the commands and the programs that you use will try to read and interpret a file irregardless of what the extension is. So um, extensions are not, um, fixed or specific um, in any way, but there are conventions um, that can help you understand and use data more effectively. Um, and uh, it can be useful, for example, to create and use those extensions when you um, create text files. To give you a quick example, um, I can uh, create a new text file called craft, no extension. Come in here and edit this file, save it, write it out. I have a file called draft. There's no way for me to know really what this is. 
other than to inspect it perhaps with the long listing here. So I can see it's not a directory, but I don't really know what it is. Um, if I cat that file, it will still work like a text file because cat assumes that the inputs are, are text files. Um, and I can also move it so I could actually give it a meaningful extension. TXT, ASCII sometimes people use for text files. Now it's a little bit more meaningful what that, that is. In fact, you can have uh, multiple dots on the end of a file like this, and the last one um, here is generally tells you the, the, the previous state. So this is a uh, compressed, G, gun zip compressed tar archive called bash dash lesson. And that's generally how people work. And in fact, these fast Q files um, are the output of a, of a program uh, that I don't uh, have any familiarity with, but they are also text files. And you can sort of see that here, sort of genome sequences in these, these text files. All right, um, are there any questions about that session? Does anyone want me to um, go back and cover anything before lunch? Or are we happy to break and come back, let's say, uh, in an hour um, at 1.30 BST? Okay, um, remember if you have any questions over the break or you want any clarifications um, on things that we've covered this morning, uh, please just drop a question in the, in the chat and I'll address it when we're all back. Um, if you have other things that you want to ask about or specific things that you're keen to, to learn over the next couple of days, also just drop those in the chat and we'll see if we can um, weave in some, some examples or some content that will, will help you all out. Um, otherwise, uh, enjoy your lunch, um, take a breather, and I will see you in about an hour's time.